Which football club do you suppose has the richest owners? India's King of Steel, Lakshmi Mittal, worth an estimated $16.6 billion, is in fact a minority shareholder at Queen's Park Rangers. Meanwhile, 31-year-old Mark Meitschitz, owner of all five Red Bull football franchises, after inheriting his late father's 49% stake in Red Bull following his death in 2022, can go one better than that, or about 23 billion better than that in fact, estimated to be worth a staggering $39.5 billion. That's enough to make Mark the world's richest millennial and the 30th richest person in the world of any age. Being the only child of the co-founder of a multi-billion dollar energy drink company will do that for you in fairness. If you're thinking that the richest owner of a football club can't possibly be a single private individual though, then you would be absolutely spot on. PSG are owned by Qatar Sports Investments, which is a subsidiary of the Qatar Investments Authority, Qatar's Sovereign Wealth Fund, founded in 2005, which has an estimated $450 billion in assets under management. Manchester City are owned by the Abu Dhabi United Group, which claims to be owned by Emirati Royal Sheikh Mansour bin Zayed Al Nayan, though leaks of internal documents show that the company is actually managed by the Abu Dhabi government. I mean, really, whoever would have thought it. Mansour has an estimated net worth of $16.8 billion, meanwhile the Abu Dhabi Investments Authority has an eye-watering $853 billion worth of assets under management. If you choose to take that Abu Dhabi United Group's word for it though, and really, why wouldn't you? They all seem like such standout guys. The situation is much more clear-cut at Newcastle United, where Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund, with their estimated $620 billion in assets under management, owns 80% of the club. So there you have it then. The richest owners in world football can be found at Paris Saint-Germain, Manchester City, and Newcastle United. What a boring and terribly short video. Or, perhaps, things aren't quite that straightforward. According to Action for Albion, a pressure group of West Bromwich Albion supporters unhappy with how their club is being run, following extensive research, the Baggies' largest individual shareholder is none other than the People's Republic of China, a nation with an economy 18 times larger than Saudi Arabia's, and a sovereign wealth fund with twice the assets, $1.35 trillion under management. Yet, whilst Newcastle United just broke into the Champions League in their first full season under Saudi ownership, and Manchester City just completed only English football's second ever continental treble, West Bromwich Albion are a club in crisis. Dodgy loans, mounting debt, and the loss of Premier League parachute payments led an audit of the Baggies' most recent accounts to conclude that there was material uncertainty surrounding the future of the club. It is a perilous situation at, arguably, the world's richest football club, owned by a more powerful state than any other football club on the planet. So just what on earth is going on? Well, today, that's what we're going to try and figure out. So sit back and relax, unless you are a West Brom fan, of course, and join me on a journey to a former boomtown of the Industrial Revolution on the outskirts of Birmingham, as we take a look at West Bromwich Albion's murky ownership structure, financial mismanagement, and potentially treacherous future. From the outside looking in, things don't seem that bad at West Brom. Since the club's takeover in the summer of 2016, the Baggies have been relegated from the Premier League in 2018, promoted in 2020, and relegated again in 2021. Over the last two seasons, they have finished 9th and 10th in the Championship, missing out on the playoffs by just three points this season, after Carlos Corberan recovered what was a dreadful start to the season under manager Steve Bruce. Perhaps it is for that reason then, with budgets slashed at local and national newspapers, and an ever more concentrated focus within football coverage on the Premier League's Big Six, where so much of the ad revenue is, that there has been so little coverage of West Brom's plate behind the scenes. It is worth noting that 10th and 9th place finishes in the Championship, 
whilst hardly cataclysmic, still represent West Brom's two worst seasons in more than 20 years. Of the preceding 14 years before West Brom were acquired by an opaque Chinese consortium in the summer of 2016, the Baggies had spent 10 of them in the Premier League, and they were promoted from the Championship in three out of the other four. In short, there was only one season in the preceding 14 years in which West Brom hadn't either been in or won promotion to the Premier League. And in the sole exception, the 2006-07 season, they finished fourth in the championship and were losing playoff finalists. It was a level of success and consistency achieved without West Brom ever spending beyond their means, unlike so many of their Premier League relegation and championship promotion rivals. Shrewd appointments like Gary Megson, Tony Mowbray and Roy Hodgson, twinned with the smart recruitment of first-team stalwarts like Gareth McCauley, James Morrison and Chris Brunt, gave West Brom a sense of stability that was sorely lacking from almost all of those around them. Whilst being a yo-yo club would have been a fine achievement given the way in which West Brom were run, they were a little bit more than that. Prior to relegation in 2018, the Baggies had spent eight successive seasons in the Premier League, finishing as high as 8th under Steve Clark and 10th under both Roy Hodgson and Tony Pulis. It's hard to believe that the West Brom of 2023 is the same club. The person who oversaw West Brom's astute day-to-day -day running throughout this period was local businessman Jeremy Peace who became West Brom's chairman in 2002 and majority shareholder in 2005 when he took the company private. In June 2016, Peace accepted an undisclosed offer, widely reported as having been between £190 and £200 million, from Yunyi Goikoi Shanghai Sports Development Limited for West Bromwich Albion Holdings Limited a holding company which owns 88% of West Bromwich Albion Group Limited, the parent company of West Bromwich Albion Football Club. The remaining 12% is owned by West Brom fans, collectively known as the Shareholders for Albion. I hope that you are still with me because it gets much more confusing than this towards the end. As well as West Brom were run, and despite their six successive top flight campaigns at that stage, the roughly £200 million that Peace received for his 88% ownership stake in West Brom was widely perceived as being an outstanding deal for him. It was roughly the same amount that Manchester City was sold for to Abu Dhabi in 2008, much more than Farhad Mashiri paid for a majority ownership stake in Everton at roughly the same time, and it valued West Brom at just £72 million less than Saudi Arabia paid to acquire Newcastle United in 2021, by which stage Premier League finances had witnessed a significant increase. The size of the deal was most likely only possible because the buyers were Chinese. During the mid-2010s, under the direct instructions of Xi Jinping and the CCP, China set about investing an absolute fortune in football, both at home and abroad. As well as buying West Brom in 2016, the Chinese state, businesses and billionaires acquired Inter Milan, bid £800 million for Liverpool, and the Chinese Super League started to rival the Premier League in terms of transfer expenditure. In the West Midlands alone, West Brom, Wolves and Aston Villa were all acquired by Chinese businesses or businessmen. Though Villa cost less than half as much as West Brom, and Wolves not even a quarter as much, meanwhile Birmingham City were owned by Hong Kong businessman Carson Young up until 2014. Things got off to a rocky start for West Brom under their mysterious new Chinese ownership regime, as manager Tony Pulis publicly voiced his displeasure with the club's summer transfer dealings. Nonetheless, West Brom finished the season in 10th place in the Premier League, a solid debut campaign, albeit only five points separated them from Watford in 17th. West Brom lost seven and failed to win any of their last nine games of the season, though, in a sign of what was to come. The following summer was chaotic. Over £40 million was invested in new arrivals, but it wasn't spent wisely at all. The Baggies' only midfield reinforcement on a permanent basis was a 36-year-old Gareth Barry. Meanwhile, Oliver Burke, signed for £13.5 million from RB Leipzig, scored zero goals in 16 games the following season, 
and Chinese international Zhang Yuning, brought to the club for £6.5 million from Vitesse, never made a first team appearance at West Brom. One suspects that Zhang wasn't top of Tony Pulis' list of transfer targets. Don't ask me why, it is just a hunch. The 2017-18 season wound up being a comedy of errors at West Brom, and a fairly pathetic end to eight seasons in English football's top flight. The Baggies were 17th when Tony Pulis was dismissed in November, but had won just four of their last 22 Premier League games, with Alan Pardew, almost a year after getting sacked by Crystal Palace, appointed as his successor. To say that there was no new manager bounce at West Brom would be a pretty hefty understatement, given that Pardew failed to win any of his first eight games in charge of the club, and just one of his first 19. In response, West Brom's owners sacked both the club's chairman, John Williams, and their CEO, Martin Goodman, in one fell swoop in February 2018, despite the fact that both were their own appointments, and the January transfer window had already slammed shut, meaning there was very little that their successors would be able to do that season regardless. West Brom pitted all of their January survival hopes and budget on the loan signing of Daniel Sturridge, who played just 116 minutes of football, each of which cost West Brom more than £50,000 and didn't score a single goal during his short spell at the Hawthorns. West Brom ended up finishing bottom of the league, but they managed to keep hold of the bulk of their squad in the championship, and within two seasons, they were back in the Premier League. Of slight concern, perhaps, to West Brom fans even then, might have been the fact that the club's star man during their promotion campaign, Mateus Pereira, was reportedly signed at the behest of manager Slaven Bilic, rather than the club's own much maligned recruitment team, who made a total hash of things once again the following summer, as West Brom were immediately relegated from the Premier League. Just before that season began, Mark Jenkins, who West Brom appointed as CEO in February 2018, despite themselves having sacked him in December 2016, was sacked for a second time, and Shu Kay, who is the sole director of the West Bromwich Albion Group, was parachuted into the job. This time around, West Brom didn't have the bones of a championship promotion winning squad, nor did they recruit well enough to create one. Over the summer, despite receiving 18 million euros for Mateus Pereira, West Brom didn't spend a single penny on transfer fees. Nonetheless, at the beginning of February, when West Brom sacked Valerian Ishmael and replaced him with Steve Bruce, they were sixth in the championship inside the playoff places. When the season finished, they were all the way down in 10. Bruce was appointed based upon his proven track record of winning promotion from the championship, which is inarguable, but he hadn't actually won promotion in six years when West Brom appointed him, and he arrived battered, bruised, and visibly still reeling, it seemed, from a brutal spell at Newcastle United. Bruce's surprise in a press conference when he was informed by journalists that clubs were allowed to make five substitutes in the upcoming campaign didn't exactly inspire confidence, Players were apparently unimpressed with his lack of attention to detail compared to his predecessor, and, and this was unusual for Bruce, he struggled to command the respect of his players. That brings us to the season just gone, which started out as an unmitigated disaster for West Brom. The Baggies secured their primary summer targets, Jed Wallace and John Swift, on free transfers from Reading and Millwall, both of whom are excellent championship players, but from that point on it was chaos. Bruce spoke of having to wait until Premier League teams had already conducted their summer business, before West Brom were able to act, but on transfer deadline day, they ended up missing out on both Josh Onomar and Steven Alzate, deals that they had banked on getting done. In the end, Martin Kelly, who had barely kicked a ball in anger for the previous two seasons, was the only deadline deal that the club could get over the line. That meant that West Brom started the season with just 16 fit senior outfield players, though those players were still of a sufficient calibre that the Baggies ought not have been 22nd in the championship, inside of the relegation zone, when Bruce was finally sacked in October. As far as some West Brom fans were concerned, Bruce was sacked far too late. 
As for the rest of them, they didn't think that he ever should have been appointed in the first place. Bruce's successor, Carlos Corbran, turned West Brom's fortunes around last season in quite spectacular fashion, taking the team from 22nd to 9th by the end of the season, and but for three defeats from their last four games, they would have made the playoffs. Though it isn't remotely Corbran's fault, for West Brom, that simply wasn't enough. The reality of this situation is that West Brom were acquired by a little-known Chinese consortium, headed by Gao Chan Lai, at a time when China was throwing hundreds of millions of pounds at anything remotely related to football. As we know, China's investment in football was as brief as it was spectacular, and the fall was even more rapid than the rise. Within a couple of years of West Brom being one of many football clubs to come under Chinese ownership, Xi and the CCP had implemented salary caps in the Chinese Super League, was privately encouraging those who had bought overseas clubs to sell them, and effectively banned any Chinese companies and individuals from buying more foreign clubs. It was a rapid U-turn, and the end result is that the Chinese Super League is on its knees, Former title-winning clubs no longer even exist, and West Brom are one of the last few European clubs who still have Chinese owners, along with their West Midlands rivals Wolves, it should be said, who have enjoyed rather different fortunes under their more reputable and transparent Chinese owners. The reason West Brom still have Chinese owners is most likely because of the inflated price that Yunyi Goikoi Shanghai Sports Development Limited paid for their 88% stake in the club seven years ago. West Brom were never worth over £200 million, but they aren't worth even a fraction of that amount as a championship club mired in financial trouble. The only way that Gao Chan Lai could sell West Brom, therefore, assuming that he is still the one calling the shots, which is another dilemma that we are about to come to, is by selling the club for far less than the consortium that he controls paid to acquire it, which he, or they, are clearly reluctant to do. That's why West Brom basically needed a freak promotion last season, which briefly seemed possible under Carlos Corberan, to allay the club's immediate financial trouble and massively increase their valuation so as to make a sale possible. West Brom's owners still probably wouldn't have regained the £200 million that they paid for the club, but they at least would have recouped something respectable. If you're wondering why a team that spent eight successive seasons in the Premier League got relegated, won promotion again, and then got relegated again, and has been in receipt of parachute payments every single season since, is in such dire financial trouble at all, then you are not alone. At fan protests last season, of which there have been many, especially since Action for Albion were formed in November 2022, one of the most frequently sung chants is, where's the money gone, and it is not an unreasonable question. The obvious answer is on wages, West Brom have one of the highest wage bills in the championship, and that inevitably accounts for most of it. But there are some other more atypical, shall we say, expenses that you will find in West Brom's accounts. In June 2022, for example, almost exactly a year ago, when West Brom's accounts for the 2020-21 season were published, they showed that West Brom had paid a loan of £4.95 million to Wisdom Smart Corporation Limited, a company which is controlled by none other than Gao Chan Lai. Lai stated that the loan had been solely to help another one of his businesses through a short-term cash flow problem during the COVID-19 pandemic and that it would be repaid by September 2021 with interest, a self-imposed deadline which, surprise, surprise, wasn't met, and appeared nowhere in the club's own accounts. The next deadline, set for New Year's Eve 2022, was also missed. West Brom's official website issued this club statement on the day, which read, The directors of West Bromwich Albion Football Club remain in dialogue with controlling shareholder and chairman Gao Chan Lai regarding an outstanding loan owed to the club by his related party, Wisdom Smart Corporation Limited. The £4.95 million loan is due for repayment with interest today, Saturday, December 31st, 2022, and Lai has assured the club's board of directors the repayment will now be made early in the new year. End quote. 
To be clear, that is the directors of West Brom remaining in dialogue with the controlling shareholder of West Brom. It is an absurd situation, which would be far more amusing if it wasn't for the fact that the future of one of the Football League's founding members is on the line. A third deadline was set then for early 2023, and there are no prizes for guessing what happened in early 2023. That's right, absolutely nothing. And in March 2023, West Brom wrote off the loan, signalling that they don't expect to ever get that money back. Lai didn't issue any comments on the matter, nor has he commented on much at West Brom over the last five years, during which time he has only attended one match. After loaning £5 million to a company, controlled by the same person who supposedly controls the club themselves, West Brom then took out a £20 million loan in December 2022 to cover the day-to-day -day running of the club. That loan is from MSD Holdings, which is the American billionaire and founder of Dell Technologies, Michael Dell's UK business. MSD Holdings have established themselves as a force within English footballing finance, having provided loans to Derby County and Southampton, as well as facilitating Burnley's leverage takeover in 2021. However, whilst West Brom's loan to Lies Wisdom Smart Corporation Limited charged interest of just £50,000, an effective interest rate of only 1% had it ever been repaid, which it obviously wasn't, the loan that they took from MSD Holdings was charged at commercial rates, namely Sonia, which just reflects the average of the interest rates that banks pay to borrow sterling overnight from other financial institutions and other institutional investors, plus 9.75% resulting in an effective rate of 13.93%. So whilst West Brom loaned money out to their quasi-owner, who never paid it back, charging interest of just £50,000 in total, they took out a £20 million commercial loan with interest payments, costing them £7,600 every day. If you think that sounds bad, it really is, but bizarrely, it's not the worst loan that West Brom have taken out. No, that would be the £2 million borrowed from Warm Front Holdings, revealed in the club's most recent set of accounts, which includes interest payments of 5%. I know what some of you will be thinking. 5%? That doesn't sound too bad in the current climate. Well, yes, except that's not 5% per annum, it's 5% a month. With compound interest, therefore, that works out at just shy of 80% interest annually and rising. You will be shocked to discover, I would imagine, that Warmfront Holdings is another company controlled by, you guessed it, our old friend Gao Chen Lai. So just to be clear, West Brom lent out £5 million to one of Lai's companies, which they've never got back, with just 1% interest, whilst borrowing £2 million from another one of his companies with 79.6% annual interest. Now, I'm not an accountant, but that doesn't seem like the best deal for West Brom themselves. What's more, that £20 million that West Brom borrowed to cover their operating expenses six months ago, well, there are reports that they've burnt through all of that cash. And given that they didn't win promotion, it's not clear exactly how they plan on repaying it. Or indeed, covering their future operating expenses as well. As if that wasn't enough, next season will be the first in over 20 years in which West Brom haven't either been competing in the Premier League or been in receipt of Premier League parachute payments, thus slashing their revenue next season compared to the one just gone. The only option, other than promotion, which would surely require further investment to be achievable, is through player sales, and it's not clear exactly how much even that would raise. The Baggies do still have some valuable assets, most notably perhaps Dara O'Shea, John Swift, and Daryl Dyke, but even a fire sale of all of those players wouldn't clear their debts and cover their operating expenses. Meanwhile, it could potentially turn them into relegation candidates next season, unless they were able to pull several rabbits out of the hat on free transfers and loan deals to replace them. 
Given the club's track record in terms of recruitment in recent years, you'll forgive West Brom fans for not holding out too much hope on that front. That is why the auditors of West Brom's most recent set of financial accounts cited material uncertainty about the future of the club and why Baggies fans are now desperate for some kind of intervention. It all begs the question, who is Gao Chen Lai and who actually owns West Bromwich Albion? Neither are straightforward questions, which, in of itself, is surely a concern, and you can't help but wonder whether an owners and directors test that lets such an opaque ownership structure through its net is itself fit and proper. When the West Brom takeover happened in 2016, most Baggies fans were under the impression that Gao Chan Lai had basically bought the club himself, and Yun Yi Gao Kai Shanghai Sports Development Limited was basically the holding company through which he had done it. The statement published by the club at the time spoke extensively of Lai's love of football, his business acumen and track record, and the ties between West Brom and China, beginning with the club's 1978 pre-season tour of Asia. The statement tied Lai very closely to a company called Palm, full name Palm Eco Town Development Company Limited, even citing Palm's £0.5 billion annual revenue in 2015, and £1.8 billion market capitalization on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange. If you weren't reading with a scrupulously critical eye, you could be forgiven for being left with the impression that Lai also owned Palm, or was the company's largest individual shareholder, but that wasn't the case either. Lai was apparently the general manager of Palm for 20 years, during which time the company grew from a plant nursery into one of China's largest and most successful landscape development and construction companies. A closer look also reveals that Lai was never described as owning Yunyi Goikoi Shanghai Sports Development Limited, but merely of controlling the little-known enterprise that had just acquired 88% of a Premier League club. The paragraph which read, The buyer is a new company, focused on the sports industry, formed for the purpose of completing the acquisition. It is controlled by Gao Chan Lai, who has provided the underlying equity for the acquisition, together with Palm and funds introduced by Yun Yi Investment, a regulated asset management company which led the negotiations on behalf of the buyer, end quote, left more questions than answers if anything. Seven years on, it remains unclear exactly what Lai's role is, how much money he's got, and what he thinks, if indeed he thinks anything at all, about the current situation or future fate of West Bromwich Albion. Research by Action for Albion concluded that West Brom's chairman, Li Pio, who is a longtime associate of Lai's, owns 12% of the club, Lao Lan and Wang Kin, no jokes please, that is the man's name, each own 9.85%, the Oversea Chinese Banking Corporation, a multinational Singaporean bank better known as OCBC Bank, own 9.5%, and two Chinese businessmen, namely Wu Gai Chang, who is the former chairman of Palm, and Shei Xingjiang, who is the billionaire founder, of one of China's largest furniture companies, own 1% and 0.67% respectively. Xinxiang, who owns 0.67% of West Brom, would be the seventh richest owner in the championship all on his own, yet the Baggies are currently staring down the financial barrel and taking £2 million loans with 80% annual interest rates. That adds up, all of that combined, to 42.87% between those five individuals, none of whom, you will note, are Gao Chan Lai and then a Singaporean bank. A further 25.49% and therefore the largest individual shareholding, and I use that word a little bit loosely, is owned by none other than the People's Republic of China. I said I used the word individual loosely because that 25.49% is made up of four different state-owned entities, though ultimately all are still the Chinese state. The mathematicians among you will have noticed that even when you factor in the additional 12% owned by the shareholders for Albion, that still only brings us to 80.36%, leaving a 19.64% stake in the club still unaccounted for. That's because, despite their best efforts, 
Action for Albion could only assess the facts that are publicly available, or at least discoverable, and that remaining 19.64% is not. It could be that Lai owns the remainder, which would make him the largest shareholder other than the People's Republic of China, but that is pure speculation. The championship is a league of insane finances, reckless spending, and all too often unscrupulous owners. But even within that wider context, the case of West Bromwich Albion is particularly egregious. West Brom is an institution which is 145 years old. And for most of my lifetime, and the lifetimes of most of you watching this, they have either been in the Premier League or fighting, and typically fighting successfully, to get back there, whilst being very well run. Now the club is deep in crisis, no one is exactly sure who owns them, it appears to be a mixture of little-known Chinese businessmen and the Chinese government, they are saddled with debt, and it's unclear exactly how they are going to be able to pay it off and drag themselves out of the mire. Throughout it all, there has been next to no communication between the West Brom owners, whoever they are, Xi Jinping I suppose, or hierarchy and the fans. Xu Kei, who left his role as CEO in February 2022 but remains a director, recently refused to answer 38 pressing questions from West Brom's minority stakeholders, shareholders for Albion, and there has been next to nothing out of the club since then. There was a time when communication from Lai would have been invaluable. Now any communication from him would likely be just as unhelpful. West Brom fans desperately want new owners. West Brom's web of owners probably want out, but for a totally unrealistic fee that will never be achieved, and that's why we should all want new ownership structures in English football, and far better regulation. For West Brom fans, that may come too late, if indeed it comes at all. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. I hope that you enjoyed it. I imagine if you were, or are a West Brom fan, that wasn't the case, but hopefully you are pleased to see someone covering it, because as far as I have seen, there hasn't been that much coverage of it. Anyway. Hit the like button if that was the case. Apparently it helps somehow with the YouTube algorithm. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And of course, make sure that you are subscribed to both this channel and to my second channel, both of which should be on your screens or be about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might want to watch after this one. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.